Hello to all. This is Minister Leonard Harris, and this is our Sunday School lesson, lesson number 13, still from the Unit 3, The Call of Women. And this is for February the 28th, 2021. And our lesson's title is Showing Generous Hospitality. Our devotional reading for our lesson is the 33rd number of Psalm, verses 1 through 12. And then our background scripture, as well as our printed passage, are Acts, the 16th chapter, verses 11 through 15, and verse number 40. Also, 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 26 through 30. And our key verse for this lesson is, when she, and I'm reading from the NIV, when she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. And this was the 14th, uh, 15th verse of the 16th chapter of Acts. And our lesson's aims are, consider how Lydia used her gifts and her place in society to support Paul's ministry. Repent of times you have looked down on others who have not had the same opportunities or advantages. And concluding from our lesson's aims, serve others joyfully through whatever means are at your disposal. And for this uh, Sunday's lesson, we have uh, two parts or uh, two divisions of our lesson. Uh, the first is serving by the river for Christ. And our second is serving for the righteousness of Christ. So uh, we would like uh, to uh, dive right into our lesson. And uh, as we begin to uh, address it, uh, first we want to ask the Lord to intervene and to uh, uh, bless this and this endeavor and this indulgence. So, Heavenly Father, we ask that these things that we say and uh, what we read and uh, what we discuss uh, will be pleasing and acceptable in your sight and that it will enable us to be better stewards of the gifts and abilities that you've given to us and that the service that we render as a result of the compelling and convicting power of your word that we will be better lights in a world of darkness and we ask it all in the name of Christ and for his sake we ask it Amen. Now, as we get into our lesson, I would recommend that uh, you begin the reading of the whole chapter of the uh, 16th chapter of the book of Acts. Uh, it unfolds uh, uh, some significant little tidbits of information along the way. Uh, before we get to the verses that have been pulled out for the lesson. Uh, 
like for instance, uh, in the beginning of the 16th chapter, it, it talks about how that uh, Paul was informed of Timothy, a uh, certain uh, a, a young man uh, who had a Jewish mother and believed to have had a Greek father. And so it talks about how uh, certain uh, customs or uh, provisions that Paul underwent with uh, Timothy to bring him along on this missionary uh, journey and a part of the beginning of uh, uh, Timothy's ministry. And it, it speaks about how that uh, so he would not run into conflict uh, with the opposers. Uh, he knew that uh, the Jews uh, also were aware that he was, he had a Greek father, so they, and a Jewish mother, and they wanted to know, they would be probing to see if he was following the mandates and customs of the Jewish faith, and uh, that being one of the uh, issues of him being circumcised. And so uh, Paul, uh, to make sure that that would not be an obstacle or stumbling block, had Timothy circumcised so that uh, when that argument arose, he would say that's already been taken care of, no need to waste time talking about that. Um, but as we read further from the beginning of the uh 16th chapter and read down uh, kind of around about the 6th verse, we find out that uh, Paul, traveling through uh, Asia Minor, uh, was coming into different areas that had become like uh, settlements or colonies of the uh, Greek Empire. And um, uh, when he was coming through the region of uh, Galatia, uh, he wanted to stop there, but the Holy Spirit forbid him for preaching in Galatia, in Asia Minor. And then uh, he traveled further to uh, Mysia and uh, Bithynia. Uh, he wanted to stop there as well, but the... Uh, Spirit uh, did not permit him to stop there. And so what we recognize here is, is that Paul had ambition or Paul had desire uh, to want to stop at areas that were not a part of God's plan. And so then it tells us that um, in a vision that a man appeared in a vision uh, to Paul at night and told him, come to Macedonia. And to he pleaded with him in his vision to come to Macedonia and help us. And so this led uh, Paul to come into an area of Philippi. And what we recognize again is, is that though many of these areas have been attributed to uh, Greek colonization, uh, but at the same time, Philippi was a Roman colony. And so um, while some of these areas have been uh, aligned with uh, being Greek settlements, they were also in a transition where now these were becoming Greek co Romanized colonies. And so now Roman authority was also overriding uh, some of the laws and customs of the Greek. And in the mix of this uh, tug of war, one uh, power losing its control and another power emerging and gaining control, we have uh, Jewish settlers uh, that are in this mix and in this controversy 
that's uh, taking place. And that brings us into our lesson where we find that uh, as a part of this inner mix of power struggles, that uh, the Jews then did not really have a synagogue uh, to wor worship in. Uh, these areas have been overtaken in power struggles. And so, uh, as it has been uh, in many cases, uh, sometimes worshipers to maintain their order of worship and to be true to their faith, many times they would uh, relocate into uh, outer lined areas uh, where there was not as much traffic and attention and a peopling. And so sometimes they would uh, go to remote areas like hills and mountain areas, and sometimes they would worship along river banks, as it was in this case. And so uh, the beginning verses of our lesson uh, tell us about um, these areas. So we have uh, Troas, we have Neapolis. Uh, Neapolis uh, today is also referred to as Naples or Niblus. And then uh, we also have um, um, uh, Samatrace, and then also Thyatira. And Thyatira is the area where we find the woman that is one of the focuses of our lesson, uh, Lydia. And uh, Lydia lived in the city of uh, Thyatira. And um, when the scripture speaks of her, uh, it talks about uh, some uh, uh, abilities that she possessed uh, that we want to uh, address and connect uh, to other scriptural texts. Uh, but when we look at this, uh, it tells us that on the Sabbath, that Paul and Silas, they went outside the city gate. So this is outside of like a metropolitan area or an occupied area. And they went out to an obscured area. And they went out of the outside of the city gate to the river uh, where they expected to find a place of prayer. So sometimes when people are um, ridiculed or when people are, uh, are oppressed or, or, or they are treated unfairly or harsh uh, with certain laws and customs of uh, declining or uh, increasing powers, uh, they, it is a normal practice. So Paul and Silas, uh, uh, when the text talks about uh, they went outside the city gate to find a river where they expected to find a place of prayer, it lets us know that uh, these were uh, like common reactions, is that well, we can't worship here because we have opposition to our form of worship. So what do we do? We go to areas that are not heavily populated. We go to remote areas, obscured areas. We usually uh, reconvene in uh, hilly, uh, hilly uh, regions, uh, sometimes in mountain regions, and sometimes off of river banks. And so uh, there, when they came to this place of prayer, it says, we sat down and began to speak to the women who gathered there. And one of those was a woman from Theatera, Thyatira, and her name was Lydia. 
And she was a dealer in purple cloth. And she was a worshiper of God. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. And as a result of her response to Paul's message, when she heard what he was saying, it says that when she and the members of her household were baptized, so they acted upon what they heard and showed that they were receptive to it by going through the ceremony of being baptized. And then it says, she invited us to her home and she used this phrase, if you consider me a believer in the Lord, come and stay at my house. And it says, and she persuaded us. Now, uh, looking at how they described Lydia, when they said that uh, she was a dealer in purple cloth, uh, I want uh, to go back uh, to the 38th, uh, 31st chapter of Proverbs. And I know somebody probably says, I knew, I knew he was going to make that reference. Uh, but it is accommodating. And so therefore, because in the 31st chapter of Proverbs, we begin to speak about the characteristics and the qualities of a virtuous woman. And so here in the uh, 21st verse, it states this, and it says, she is not afraid of snow for her household. Meaning that uh, she's not afraid of uh, any uh, uh, weather uh, in the climate or uh, she, because she's made preparations for that. And so uh, she's not fearful of the, uh, uh, the voicing of a storm or, or uh, some type of uh, inclement weather uh, because she, her storehouse is ready for that. And so it says she is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household is clothed with scarlet. And then in verse 22, it says, she makes tapestry for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. And I thought that was of significance because Lydia, they mention of her as being a woman who was a dealer in purple, purple cloth. And so purple cloth linen uh, was not a cheap fabric uh, even in that day. And it's still uh, not cheap today. And so uh, we find that Lydia is one who is able to uh, take fine linen and make clothing from it uh, for her household. And so uh, we definitely wanted to uh, lift that and to uh, bring that out. Now, in the first part of our lesson, Serving by the River for Christ, it jumps from verse 15 and then it ends up with verse 40. And it tells us that after Paul and Silas have come out of prison, that they went to Lydia's house where they met with brothers and sisters and in, they were comforted and they were encouraged. And so it says, then uh, they left. And so uh, again, we would recommend the reading of the entire chapter, the 16th chapter of the book of Acts. Now, you will find, as we read further into the lesson, uh, we find out what caused Paul and Silas to be thrown into prison. Well, uh, that 
drama unfolds uh, starting at the 16th verse of the 16th chapter. And it talks about a slave girl who was possessed with the spirit of divination. And it said that she met them and uh, she brought her masters uh, much profit for fortune teller. So she was a fortune teller. And uh, the lesson says, as we read further, not the lesson, but the text, the 16th chapter starting at the 16th verse, it goes on to say that the possessed girl who was a fortune teller, call me now. So she followed, she began to follow Paul and Silas, and she was uh, publicly stating uh, uh, proclaiming as she was following them that these men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And uh, the text tells us, as you read into it, you'll see that Paul became annoyed by it. And so then Paul commanded that the spirit of deviation, of divination, would leave her and come out of her. And the text tells us that as soon as Paul said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, then the spirit came out. And therein lies what caused Paul and Silas uh, to be thrown into prison. Because Paul and Silas, it says that her master saw that the hope of their prophet was gone. And so they were swindlers. They were using the slave girl and they were using her for their hustle. And when you begin to start messing with people's hustle and, and messing with those dollars, uh, you can expect these were not godly people. Uh, sometimes this even crosses the line on godly people. But these were not godly people. And so they were like, uh, look, these two guys right here, uh, we got to do something about them. Uh, they, they just closed off our profit line. There's no more. Call me now. So now what happens is, is that once they see this, they bring this before the magistrates. So they bring this before people of authority in the marketplace. And they tell them that, hey, uh, these two guys here, they're teaching against our customs. Uh, and it's not lawful for us, uh, being Romans, uh, to receive or to observe. And so once they begin to voice uh, their, their complaint about Paul and Silas's behavior, but well, then the magistrate said, well, they tore their clothes off of them and then they beat them and they threw them into prison. And I'm sure uh, the Bible scholars remember the story of how an earthquake occurred uh, while Paul and Silas was in prison. Now, Paul and Silas had been beaten and thrown into prison, but it said that they were praying and singing hymns. And while they were praying, praying and singing hymns, suddenly an earthquake came and it shook the foundation and it opened up the cells to the prison. And the guard uh, who, who was a, uh, uh, a keeper of the prison, when the guard saw it, knowing what the consequences were going to be, the guard, the guard drew his sword and he was going to take his life. Because he knew once the authorities found out that the prisons had been freed, regardless to the fact that it wasn't of his doing, but it was an act of God, it was the earthquake that did it, he knew they were still going to take his head. And so as a result of this, well then, uh, Paul had to assure him, hey, 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 slow up, you don't have to take your life, we're all still here. And, well, you know the story. So uh, 
the man was overwhelmed by what Paul and them said. He asked them what could he do to be saved. He invited them to his house. He fed them. And then later, uh, it says that he went before the magistrates and they sent officers saying, you can let these men go. But here comes the clincher. He said, well, you can go ahead and you can let these men go. But then Paul said, hmm, ain't that something? So now these folks are going to publicly embarrass us and then have us beaten and then thrown into prison. But then they're too cowardly. You read all the way through the text, starting down at the 35th verse, reading all the way through the 40. He said, but they're too cowardly to come out and publicly say uh, there are no charges against you men. You men are free to go and do as you will. Oh, now they're going to send some messengers to clean up the mess that they caused. And so it says that, well, Paul uh, told them, well, they openly insulted us. They openly embarrassed us so why don't they openly come back and then say we were wrong and uh, uh, you guys indeed uh, can just go as you please and uh, leave this area so Paul makes this to them and when they find out that Paul and Silas are also Roman citizens uh, then they begin to shake even more so because, of, as I said, the Greek uh, were coming towards the end of their power and control, and Rome was emerging. And Rome uh, didn't have the same fear of people's religious practices, but the Greek... Uh, and many of those Orthodox Jews, uh, they were fearful. And so, but what the Greek magistrate and authorities feared more so was the authority, the emerging authority and power of Rome. And when they found out, what? Paul and Silas are Romans? I thought they were Jews. Well, uh-oh. So that created even more fear. And then they did come to let them know, hey, why don't you all depart from this city? And that is what brings us to verse 40, where they return and they go to Lydia's house. And then they begin to engage with her brothers and sisters, uh, brothers and sisters of the faith. And uh, they have comfort and encouragement for each other. Now, the other part of our lesson uh, talks to us about serving the righteousness or serving for the righteousness of Christ. And in this, uh, we pretty much can just uh, read the text because the wording speaks for itself. And it says that, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called, not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were noble at birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world, not that they were foolish to God, but they were foolish to the world, to the people who had self-made standards and forms of status that they established to place themselves on pedestals unworthy of godly wisdom. But it says, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things 
and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him, speaking of God, that you are in Christ Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. Emmanuel, God is with us. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Um, Sometimes uh, we don't uh, fully weigh and take account for the glory that has befallen upon those of us who, if we would judge ourselves according to worldly status and worldly, worldly worth, that we would sometimes think that we're not equal to the standards. But Scripture has clearly said, and, and if you get a chance, uh, although uh, our lesson, the Scriptures, are from 26 to 30, but if you get a chance, uh, you should uh, start the reading at the 18th verse of 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. You should start at 18 and read all the way through to 30 because it makes clear for us, and and, uh, I'm compelled by what it says to just read it anyway, but it says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom didn't even know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Because of the ignorance of those... uh, uh, Convicted by worldly wisdom, they were so wise in themselves until they couldn't even recognize the true wisdom of God in the person of Christ. Because uh, uh, sometimes we, uh, the worldly people uh, speak of those who are not worldly as not, uh, being misinformed, miseducated. Well, Maybe in reality, in the eyesight of God, it is those that are worldly that are misinformed. That was why they couldn't recognize Christ and they were miseducated. Uh, But then it says, for the Jews request a sign and the Greek seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. And because we do that, to the Jews, it's a stumbling block. But to the Greek, it's foolishness. You know, the Greek have appointed themselves as the father of every form of discipline of learning that there is. When every form of discipline that is, that they claim to be the fathers of, was already in existence before they even stepped onto the human plane. But yet, it says... Because the foolishness of God is wiser 
than man, wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than man. So as we look at our lesson, uh, let us treasure and cherish the wisdom and the prophetic word that God has given to those that worldliness would say are the unlearned. Uh, they're not equal to our status. Uh, they are the least of those. Let us uh, be rejoicing that God said, and when you have done this to the least of of these, my brothers and sisters, you have done it also unto me. We hope that something that we've said has been fruitful and beneficial to your listening, and we thank God for what he has allowed us to share through scripture, and we just, as always, ask that uh, we would not just be hearers of the word alone, but that we would also be doers of the word of God. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.